thank you, Charles, for joining and thanks everyone else as well. I want to introduce Charles first and I want to say about a month and a half ago, sometime in December, I ran into uh, one of Charles's recent editorials in the political magazine about pandemics closing borders. And I got really excited. It's a great piece. Everyone should go and find it and read it. But then I was looking through other stuff that you've written, Charles, and I found a manifesto for globalization. And I thought, oh, this is so great. This was one of the best things I've read uh, in the last six or seven months, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll share a link in the chat once we get to the Q&A so everyone can find it and read it. But I've definitely become a big fanboy in the last few months. Uh, you've been in, in your most, most recent project, you're investigating the history of disease. And the book is called The Plague Cycle. Everyone who's here should read it. This is going to be a great introduction to the ideas, but I think we'll only be able to scratch the surface. Um, and, and I think one of the most exciting elements of the book is that uh, Kenny is really a champion for global connections, for openness in a world that's becoming more and more oriented towards exclusion and being closed off. A uh, glance through his work at the Center for Global Development showed that he's got, done a lot of research on a lot of different important policy issues. And I think the plague cycle is best summarized in, in this quote. The history of infection teaches a particular lesson to those who want to withdraw from international cooperation. If disease becomes the excuse for closing borders and deploying force, the cost to global progress will be immense. And that's why I'm excited to have you here, Charles. And once again, just before we get started on talking about the book in depth, there's again a, a chat box and a Q&A box. If you enter your Q&As in the Q&A section, we'll get to them once we turn towards the audience Q&A. Uh, but let's get into it. Thanks again, Charles. I think the best place to start is what motivated you to write the book? And in particular, what's the motivation behind the title, The Plague Cycle? Gosh, thanks very much for having me and, and thanks everybody for joining. Uh, uh, it, it's great to be virtually here. Um, so I have spent a lot of my life in, in global development. Um, I used to work at the World Bank and, and I've been at this think tank, the Center for Global Development for the last 10 years or so, uh, which is all about thinking through the policies of, of rich countries and how they uh, affect the developing world. And I wrote a previous book called Getting Better, which was basically the sort of the story of the last 40 or 50 years of, of global development. And it's a you know, broadly positive story. Uh, fewer kids dying young, uh, more people going to school, more people uh, living in countries that are broadly democratic, um, so on and so forth. Uh, it was written 10 years ago. It would be a slightly more difficult book to write today. But uh, while I was writing it, you know, one of the big and sort of unarguable and not stopped by COVID-19 stories of the last 40 or 50 years is the decline in, in premature mortality. If you just look at the risk of a child dying under the age of five, it's it's about one fifth of what it was uh, a few decades ago. And there's one big reason for that, and that's infectious diseases. And so that got me sort of interested in, 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 in the topic of infectious disease and their decline, um, which got me interested in the topic of their rise in the first place. And so the plague cycle is basically the, you know, sort of the history of infectious disease from the beginning, if you will, till now. Um, obviously, it skips out a fair amount. It's, it's not an encyclopedia. Um, but, uh, it, you know, broadly, that's what it covers. And... The reason for the title of the book is because one of the interesting things that you see looking at infection is, is the patterns of how they come and go. So we're all fairly familiar with the, the flu cycle, if you will, the, the kind of once every year we, 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 we get flu season. Um, one of the small silver linings from, from the, the last terrible year has been actually we haven't seen much of a flu season. It, turns out all the things we're doing against COVID-19 stop people getting the flu. Um, but so that's a sort of yearly cycle. And then um, there are epidemic cycles that go over uh, a, a few more years than just once. So for example, measles through much of history was a disease that would come and go. And the reason it would come and go is that it would arrive, it would infect a lot of people. Measles is much more infectious than, than even COVID-19. It infects a lot of people. Um, they would either get sick and die luckily not too many of them but you know some of them would get sick and die or they would get sick and get better uh if they got better they would they would uh, have immunity uh measles needs a lot of people to infect to sort of keep the cycle going and so after a while it would run out of new victims if you will and then it would disappear uh and it would 
find you know a, a new civilization and new set of towns to, to to influence but when you're born you don't have natural immunity to measles and so after a few years of new births measles could come back and and attack all of the the, the newborns and so that's a sort of epidemic cycle and that's you know years maybe decades um, the sort of the plague cycle of the title, if you will, is the plague cycle of, of the disease that we sort of think of when we think of the Black Death, Yersinia pestis. And that, um, I discovered sort of since writing the book, that uh, that disease probably first arrived, at least in Europe, um, along with the first horseman uh, riding the first horses to appear in, in Europe. Um, then maybe it you know, reappeared after that, but the next sort of time we know it reappeared was the, the plague of Justinian, uh, which basically ended the Roman Empire. And then the famed Black Death uh, of the 14th century, which you know, wiped out the third to two thirds of the population of, of Europe. Um, and then again in the 19th century. So that's a kind of you know, multi-century uh, cycle of plagues linked in part to how much trade was going on across Eurasia, weather patterns, uh, how dense populations were in Europe. And then there's this final cycle uh, of disease that um, you know, worries me a bit, uh, which is the first, the rise at the start of civilization. Uh, infectious diseases like density, they like lots of people living close together and well connected. And uh, early civilization, early agriculture, made communities a lot more dense, put a lot more people close together. That was great for infectious diseases. Measles that I mentioned earlier didn't exist uh, before we had uh, agriculture and, and trade because there weren't large enough communities to sustain it. Um, so a bunch of diseases emerged in sort of the, the, the first era of pandemics, if you will, at the, at the birth of agriculture and civilization. We then spread them worldwide, um, you know, famously, uh, Columbus and, and those who came after him spread um, a, a lot of old world diseases to the Americas and killed off, you know, 80, 90 percent of, of native populations. Um, and then other European explorers spread diseases to Australia and Japan and so on. Uh, so, you know, the pandemic era continued until pretty much modern medicine and sanitation hit uh, in the in the 19th and 20th century and that goes back to you know where my original interest lie was that that after that we suddenly saw infectious disease drop off a cliff if you will in terms of, of death rates but then there's this fear of the third pandemic age the cycle kind of coming second pandemic age the cycle coming back again because our victories over infection, ironically, have created a world that is more connected, more dense, more populated than ever before, which is perfect for the emergence of new diseases. Um, and so sort of the ultimate cycle is, if you will, is the idea that we might be coming back into an age of greater pandemic death. I don't think we will. I think we'll manage to you know, turn the corner. I think COVID-19 will be is a disaster, but is also a wake up call and will help make sure that we don't enter a new age of pandemics and we better control it uh, through global cooperation. That's my hope at least. So that's the reason for the title, if you will, all of these cycles appearing from, from, from years through decades, through centuries, through whole epochs uh, uh, around, around pandemics. And that's, that's, the, that's what the book is about. Right, and I think you write uh, in the book that the problem both in 1918, 122, 102 years ago and today is that it wasn't that we didn't know what to do, it's that we didn't do it. So when you say we needed this wake up call, what kinds of steps should we be taking to build the institutions, to build the state capacity to respond better next time? Because I read your book as broadly optimistic, but it does have a sort of pessimistic undertone of we are not a question of if it will happen, but when. Yeah, I, I, I think we will see the emergence of, of more new diseases. I think you're right. And, and, and that's because COVID-19 isn't a one-off. You know, in the last few decades, we've, we've, we've seen AIDS, we've seen Nipah, we've seen you know, Whitewater, or, 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 you know, the, the list goes on. We've, we've seen new versions of old diseases too. So uh, uh, antibiotic-resistant plague is emerging, for example. So I think it is, it is a matter of when, not if, and the question is how we respond. As you say, one of the depressing things about COVID-19 is uh, sort of two sides to the story, right? There's the, the, the optimistic side of the story is 
never before in human history have we developed a vaccine against a disease as rapidly as we did this time. Never before in human history, almost certainly, will we roll that out as fast as we're, we're going to, which is not to say it's fast enough or equitable enough, but you know, compared to the past, if we'd gone back 40 years, we wouldn't have had any of the technologies involved in the vaccines we've got so far. Um, if we'd gone back 200 years, we never would have developed a vaccine against uh, uh, COVID-19. So, you know, sign of huge progress. But there are these old techniques, which for some reason we keep on forgetting about. One of the fascinating things that happened uh, in the economics field, at least uh, it's sort of in the early mid part of last year, was a whole bunch of papers came out about, oh, look at the 1918 flu pandemic. And, and, and they tried masks and they tried social distancing and they tried shutting schools. How, how did that work then? And you know, what, what, what happened? Um, research that would have been really useful to have had at the start rather than you know, a few months in um, and, and a sign of how much we pretty much completely forgot uh, about 1918 and the lessons learned. And 1918 wasn't the first time. Uh, the, the, the cover of the plague cycle is a, is a allegory of death, um, a picture of death, got his scythe. Um, it draws from a picture from a French newspaper uh, in 1911, which was sort of the cover art of the, of the newspaper talking about an outbreak of a pneumonic plague in Manchuria, uh, which they dealt with using social distancing and masks and travel restrictions and so on. Um, I mentioned in the book that Marco Polo talks about uh, uh, the Chinese emperor going to a, a banquet at the Chinese emperors. They're all wearing masks to, 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 to keep their, I can't remember the exact word, effluence, I think it is, uh, off the food. You know, A lot of the technologies we use, we've used against COVID are, are not new technologies, but we forgot about how to use them properly. And, uh, it is really depressing that we do seem to forget these lessons. It's interesting that some of the countries that did best against COVID-19 were those that had recently experienced SARS the hardest. And they kind of, they put in place, you know, testing and tracking systems, for example, and, and, and everybody started wearing masks much more quickly. And, and you know, the Taiwans and the South Koreas have controlled uh, uh, COVID-19 much better than us. So we do seem to forget these lessons. I think to ask your question about, well, you know, how do we avoid that next time? We institutionalize stuff. Um, we need at the national level, you know, sort of a stronger CDC, if you will, with, with more capacity to respond at the, at the federal level and, and, and put in, you know, strict guidance um, around things like masking. Um, and at the international level, we need a much stronger World Health Organization. The best way we could have prevented COVID-19 would have been if we could have really controlled it in China. Now, China, in, in, in Wuhan, in China, it, China bears some of the responsibility for that. It was not um, open about the problem early on. Um, maybe because COVID-19 is in asymptomatic, it's just too much to expect that you know, anybody could have caught it and, and dealt with it early enough. Um, but it had the sort of the world responded really rapidly at the start and, and the rest of the world carries the main burden for that, including Europe and the United States and Latin America. Uh, had we responded really hard at the start, we could all be in the position that China is in today where you know, there isn't much spread of COVID-19. Maybe many of us could be in a position of uh, New Zealand today where there is no COVID-19 in, in, in the country. That would have had a bunch of good effects. We would have saved a lot of life, but also we would have stopped these mutations happening. Mutations happen in places where there's lots of you know, COVID-19 viruses out there um, going around um, reproducing. That's, that's you know, what, what leads to um, uh, mutations occurring. So we could have been in a much better state if we'd all acted you know, much faster, much harder. And global coordination and cooperation would really help that. And so you know, I hope the lesson for next time is we, we put in place stronger institutions at the national level to make sure that we can, for instance, track and trace, uh, uh, test and trace at scale very rapidly, but also much stronger global institutions to make sure that every country can do the same. I think New Zealand brings up an interesting question about what you think the effectiveness of immigration and travel restrictions are. New Zealand's in a unique uh, situation, uh, but what kinds of measures should countries be taking there if we want to have global connections and uh, global institutions to control the spread of what is a global disease? How do we uh, how do we control and 
manage the, just the movement of people. Absolutely. So the, my colleague, Michael Clemens, uh, wrote a paper a couple of months ago now um, that basically looked at past pandemics and how they spread, uh, including the 1918 flu. Now, one thing is, he said, they spread about as fast back in 1918 as they do today, which tells you something about the level of international travel we need in order to stop a uh, pandemic spreading worldwide. It would have to be less than 1918 at least, right? That is a fraction of what we've got today. We're talking about stopping most travel that happens, 80, 90% of the travel that happens today. And frankly, I can go back further than 1918 to give you an example. Um, Columbus brought back syphilis from the New World on three small caravels um, and possibly, you know, probably didn't need all three. Um, his uh, uh, shipmates then spread it around Europe fairly rapidly um, and, you know, uh, it's it spread on uh, through Asia. Um, some of his shipmates uh, either ended up with, uh, ended up on or had friends who ended up on Vasco da Gama's ship that went around Africa um, and, and, and found the, the sea routes to India. And uh, India got syphilis very quickly, uh, thanks to Vasco da Gama's uh, shipmates. So you need sort of one caravel's worth of globalization, if you will, to, 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 to spread diseases worldwide. So travel bans as a kind of, or travel restrictions as a permanent measure against infectious disease, are just not plausible. Travel restrictions immediately after a new pandemic appears sometimes have a role. Now, I, I mentioned the, the problem of the asymptomatic uh, nature of COVID-19 in a lot of cases. Um, that's one reason why we think there was COVID-19 in the US you know, months before uh, any talk of, of, of travel restrictions from the US government. Um, and the same in France and the same in Italy, you know, that, that this disease had already spread way before anybody thought of putting in uh, travel restrictions. Uh, those travel restrictions were then put in in a really silly way. As I say, in order to have travel restrictions be really effective, you effectively have to move back to pre-Columbian times. You have to move back to uh, 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 zero caravels are allowed to travel. Um, Instead, what governments did was they said, well, we're going to kind of restrict travel. Of course, if, if you're a citizen, you can come back in and, you know, exceptions this, exceptions that, exceptions the other. The only thing that did, oh, and by the way, we're going to put them in place in a few days time. The only thing that did was made a whole load of people go, Oop, better get home now, um, and massively crowded airports leading to hugely long delays getting through customs and so on. Lots of people crowded around together for hours and hours inside the very last thing you wanted during um, a, a pandemic and it you know maybe one of the reasons that new york was hit so hard so early was that jfk and newark were packed out for you know hours and hours um, at a time uh, in the days sort of immediately around the announcement of the travel ban but there are exceptions new zealand which has, you know, which is where your question started, has, has controlled domestic spread. There is none. The only way it's going to come in is if somebody flies in with it. And so having quarantines and multiple testing before somebody who wants to come to New Zealand is allowed into the country makes complete sense to me. And I, and, you know, I fully support it. And the same with Taiwan. Um, but most of the world is just so far away from anywhere near that level of control, that travel bans just, you know, simply don't make much sense. And of course, New Zealand is going to face a choice at some point, I hope, you know, not immediately, but in, you know, eight months, 12 months, uh, hopefully by then a lot of the world will have been vaccinated um, and a lot of New Zealanders will have been vaccinated. It's going to have to open up, open back up. New Zealand is by no means a society that can live without international trade and commerce. Uh, not least, it, it relies heavily on tourism, but obviously it imports a huge amount of stuff. Uh, it exports a huge amount of, 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 of produce as well. It you know, needs globalization in order to have a high quality of life. So it's just not sustainable to cut off all travel forever. And, you know, at some point when the risk from COVID has gone down because of 
spreading vaccination programs, they're going to open back up. What do you think uh, related to that uh, about the arguments for repatriating supply chains, bringing them back into the US or into individual countries? Uh, I think your New Zealand example gets to the core of this, but is that going to be a way for nations to support their own national defense or resiliency in the next pandemic? So it's irrelevant to most countries. Uh, uh, a lot of countries around the world you know, simply don't, for example, have a domestic pharmaceutical industry, and it would be ridiculous for them to try and set up the entire chain of, uh, of, of manufacturing that you need in order to create a pharmaceutical industry because their domestic demand is so small. Um, you know, it would lead to massively expensive drugs and, and, and just you know, isn't plausible. Now, for some countries, the US, you know, the UK, Germany, so on, it's a plausible option. Uh, it would make things more expensive, um, uh, but it's a, at least sort of, you can imagine it working in theory. My problem with it is it would have the opposite effect from what we want. What we want is for uh, our supplies to be more robust and, and um, uh, you know, for there be, to be enough during a pandemic. Pandemics close things down. So if you suddenly have a pandemic in a country and all of your supply comes from that country, you're in trouble. That's actually sort of what started all of this. It was that, that a lot of our supplies uh, came from China. China was shutting down factories because they had a pandemic and that led to shortages here. Well, you may have noticed we had a pandemic in the United States as well. If all of our supplies had been coming from the United States, we would have faced exactly the same problem. So what this speaks to is not that you want to repatriate your supply chains, you want to diversify your supply chains. You don't want to be relying on just one country or just one factory. You want to have multiple factories in multiple countries that you can draw from. And that way, you know, you are sort of robust to pandemic outbreaks. And also, you know, if there's an earthquake, you're robust to that. Um, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're robust to nat natural disasters. And so it seems to me that the, the um, idea of, of, gosh, we've got to think about our medicine supply chains and PPE supply chains and so on is, is absolutely right. And we were too reliant on too few suppliers and didn't have spare capacity. So you know, right to be thinking about the problem. The proposed solution of reshore everything would make things worse, not better. I think a related question to this is how we deal with the exclusion instinct that you discuss in the book. because. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, you had representatives writing to the CDC saying illegal immigrants are bringing disease. This is a big problem. Throughout uh, history, it's often minority groups or whatever country, the country experiencing the pandemic doesn't like gets blamed for the onset of the disease. So you talk in the book about exclusion was originally an effective strategy when we didn't have other options. But now, how do we deal with that deep-rooted historical legacy of exclusion well as you, as you say the, the book sort of is packed full of horrible examples of the other being treated terribly as a result of, of infection um it starts with the other ape um the uh you know apes actually do keep strangers out of their communities um uh, uh, for a couple of weeks before admitting them partially we think on the grounds of sort of it's a quarantine system or if you will you know make, make sure that they're, they're they're not sick but but sort of far worse than that is what humans do to each other you know from pogroms during the black deaths against uh, jewish populations who were supposedly caused the black death by poisoning wells um uh, an idea that goes back to the plague of Athens, where the Athenians were blaming the, 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 the Persians for having done the same thing. Um, sort of ridiculous and repeated through history, the same lies about what um, the other have done. And you know, when it comes to US immigration policy, uh, banning anybody with, with, with AIDS coming in, at, at least was sort of on the plus side, I guess, was, was, was um, uh, uh, actually aimed at the disease rather than a, 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 a an ethnic group but was still just you know an immense act of um, an immensely damaging act um, uh, both for US national security but also obviously for the people involved um, so it is it is repeated through history as you point out there is there's some method behind the madness which is to say people from other places 
quite often do have diseases you haven't experienced before. I remind you again of Columbus. Um, uh, so, you know, that's, that's fair enough. And two, if you find somebody is diseased, staying away from them or keeping them away from you, if it's an infectious disease that you know uh, uh, spreads through touch or contact or or, or 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 aerosol, you know that makes sense. And and you know the six feet rule for for, for COVID nineteen makes sense. Um, so there is there is some uh, uh, you know reason behind parts of uh, uh, of this. But but today, two things are true. One is um, it should be definitely about staying away from sick people rather than groups you consider sick that's just crazy um and and so uh we want our measures to be colorblind if you will um uh, uh and and apply to all equally not mexican immigrants not uh, uh you know particular ethnic groups um and 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 Secondly, it just doesn't it doesn't make sense really to 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 think of exclusion at borders, um, or think of exclusion more at borders than other places. As a rule, you know, the, the risk of somebody from one side of a border compared to the risk of somebody from the other side of a border usually is about the same. Um, so uh, you've got to think about what sort of the right level of exclusion is. Um, isolating the sick individual makes an immense amount of sense. Sometimes um, isolating a community where you think you've, that's the only place the disease is makes sense. Rarely, you know, once you've got to the level of a country, it's usually too late and it doesn't make any sense. And this reminds me or makes me think of vaccine skeptical communities. What's the right steps forward to make sure that our vaccine reaches as many people as possible. Uh, I think vaccines are, have, as your book demonstrates, been powerful ways to you know, extend lifespans and save people from untold suffering. But how do we make sure that they reach people, that people who are eligible get them and get them as fast as possible? So the, uh, I mean, vaccines save millions of lives each year. Uh, we wiped out smallpox, a disease that killed hundreds of millions uh, last last century and the centuries before, you know, we wiped it out worldwide using vaccines. They are an immensely powerful tool. The parents and people who um, refuse uh, to get their kids vaccinated uh, or, or to get vaccinated themselves, I, I I feel sorry for them. Some of them have better reasons than others for their doubts. Uh, there is a fairly ugly colonial history of unsafe vaccination campaigns, for example, using the same needle to vaccinate thousands of people without cleaning it between each vaccination. That is a fantastic way to spread infection, not stop it. Uh, you know, the, the CIA uh, used vaccine campaigns to, to uh, try and get um, intelligence on, on Osama bin Laden. Not surprisingly, that made Taliban supporters a little bit skeptical of, of vaccination. So, you know, some groups have more or less reason um, uh, for, for their vaccine uh, skepticism. In the case of COVID-19, I think it will go down as more and more people get the vaccine and, you know, don't get sick. Uh, don't get sick from COVID-19 and don't get sick from the vaccination. Um, I should note that some people do have a pretty rough day after the second dose and, and we should be careful you know, to be honest about the fact that this may not be a pain-free experience getting the vaccine, but it is, it seems to be remarkably safe. Um, so I, I do think, in, to some extent, this is a matter of time, that, that as people see, see that it works, it'll be more effective. I do think there's some role for coercion. Um, I am in favour of rules that say you can't, you know, you can't send your kid to the school with my kid unless your kid is vaccinated. Um, I'm, I'm amazed at the moment, the US Navy seems to be, uh, it's got enough um, vaccines to, to, to vaccinate at least um, the, the crews on aircraft carriers and is saying, yeah, but it's up to you whether you want to take it or not. Um, that seems an interesting move from a national security perspective. I would have thought that you'd be telling soldiers to take it and, 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 and naval personnel to take it, but there we are. Um, uh, I also think that doctors who spread lies about uh, vaccine efficacy and vaccine safety should be struck off. And one of the sort of the terrible things we've seen in the last few years 
is doctors sort of pandering to the fears of, of some of their patients and, and saying, well, you know, I don't actually have any evidence for the statement, but because my patients are uncomfortable, I'm going to say it's absolutely fine not to take vaccines. That, that is just irresponsible medical practice and, 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 and those doctors should be struck off. So it's sort of a combination of approaches. I, I don't think it works to shame those people who uh, don't want to take vaccines. Again, you know, we're not in their heads. We don't know what they're thinking. Uh, so sort of morally, it's probably wrong to shame them too. I don't think it works. So uh, uh, I, I think it needs to be you know, about persuasion and demonstration uh, for individuals backed up with some uh, coercion when it comes to the to doctors and to to public spaces like schools and hospitals and and aircraft carriers i think the the development of the vaccine is an example of the kind of connections and the benefits of connections so i'd love to hear you uh, kind of talk about how the vaccine was developed and how policy can contribute to making sure we get the right vaccines quickly in the next pandemic as well the the reason that we, I mean, we should have done better, but the reason we did as well as we did with COVID-19 uh, was largely about global connections. The, the, uh, the RNA, the, 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 the genetic code of uh, COVID-19 itself uh, was sort of disentangled by Chinese researchers and spread worldwide within, you know, weeks of the outbreak the first tests um the how to how to make them uh, that information was shared worldwide from china and south korea very early on uh, in the pandemic and we all benefited from it um the the world health organization ran a whole bunch of different trials of of, of treatments um taking advantage of the fact that it's much easier to find out if something works when you test it on 100,000 people than it is on 10. Um, so taking advantage of global scale to try and get the results as quickly as possible. The vaccines themselves, I mean, so uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the Pfizer vaccine was sort of research and created by Turkish immigrants living in Germany, and Pfizer itself is a US company that is run by a Greek CEO. You know, it, it, you, you can't sort of make it more obvious how important globalization is uh, to the speed of our response um, than that. I, the, you know, I could tell you a similar story about Moderna. Um, I could tell you exactly the same story pretty much uh, about the first Ebola uh, vaccine. You know, multi, these are multi-country efforts. They're multi-country in the research, they're multi-country in the development, and they're multi-country in the testing, and it makes it faster and better. So uh, uh, it really is a story of global connections mattering a huge amount. And it's why I think our responses to pandemics you know, cannot be, vaccine nationalism cannot be national, national responses. We really have to think globally. And I think on the one hand, global connections are sharpening our tools to fight the next pandemic. But you also write about how we're blunting those same tools like antibiotics by overuse. And I, what kinds of policy responses do we need to make sure that we have more antibiotics that are more effective and that we're not overusing them to the point where we end up in the next pandemic without antibiotics? I read an article in The Guardian the other day saying that the next pandemic has already started and it is the pandemic of uh, antibiotic resistance. And I think there is something to that. Um, it's already killing you know, tens of thousands of people a year. Uh, by 2050, one prediction is that we're killing 10 million people a year unless we do something about it. And uh, it is, it's, a, it's a complex problem. Um, which needs multiple things to address it, not least more research in, into new antibiotics. And you know, there's a big role for government and international collaboration on that, but also much more careful use. Uh, the, a, a lot, if not the majority of um, antibiotics given to humans each year are given for conditions that an the antibiotic won't cure. Um, and that's because people self-prescribe for a cold, as it might be. Uh, it's that doctors hear a bunch of symptoms and go, oh, well, that could be a, a, a bacteria. So let's give them an antibiotic because at least it'll get them out the door and they'll stop bothering me. Um, you know, all sorts of reasons why we, we, we misprescribe a lot. Um, add into that the fact that there is a burgeoning global uh, animal population population uh, in factory farms that is regularly given uh, small doses of antibiotics to help 
the growth. And actually, that's where 80, 90 percent of the world's antibiotics go. It's not to humans, it's to livestock. And um, feeding animals a low dose of antibiotics in a really crowded environment is a fantastic way to allow a bacteria to um, to evolve into a version that is antibiotic resistance and then spread around a bunch of other farm animals um, because they're all right there. Um, so, you know, you sell on factory farm at low doses is just a really scary thing and is is happening more and more as, as the world gets richer and eats more meat. Um, and so we have to think about how we're going to respond to this problem. And, and there are a bunch of different parts to it. Um, there is, as I say, more, more research into new antibiotics. There is better rules around prescription for humans. There is limiting the kind of antibiotics that can be used on farms and the way they can be used. So uh, let's keep some antibiotics just for humans. Thank you very much. Um, and let's um, make sure that uh, the antibiotics used by farms and used on farms aren't used at low doses for growth promotion. Uh, and reduce their use overall by improving sanitation. That's true for humans too. Um, you know, a big reason we use antibiotics is because sanitary approaches aren't, aren't doing the job properly. Um, and so people are getting infections that they wouldn't get if the community they lived in was a bit cleaner. And so good old fashioned, you know, plumbed toilets are a big part of the story here as well. And, and, and you know, I'd love to see more support for that as well. That's uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask as well is you talk about the sanitation revolution and the medical revolution. Which do you think is, is more important? It sounds a little bit like the sanitation is something we should work on even more. Or is it something we need both sanitation and increased medical? So back to your um, uh, point about anti-vaxxers. Um, one of the things that anti-vaxxers point to uh, when they say oh, yeah, the vaccines don't work, we don't need them, is in the UK and the US, most most of the decline in measles deaths, for example, happened way before there was a measles vaccine. Not way before, decades before there was a measles vaccine. Uh, and the reason is that actually, you know, other approaches really helped reduce the, the toll from measles, including, you know, better sanitation. And so uh, it is, in, in the rich world, I think it is fair to say that, you know, sanitation did a lot of the work. I wouldn't want to put an exact proportion on it, but, um, you know, a lot. Um, uh, and then vaccinations came along and, and did a lot more, um, you know, added, as did antibiotics uh, uh, and, and other medical responses. Um, in the developing world, a bunch of places that simply don't have decent sanitary systems and, you know, pardon me, but shitting in a bag and throwing it over the wall is kind of the standard in, in, in some slums in, in, in poorer developing countries. Um, they're still seeing much, much, much lower death rates than we saw in Europe in the last century or, or we saw in those countries a few decades ago. And there, you know, the story really is a, is a medical story. So yay ray modern medicine but it shouldn't it can't and shouldn't stand alone the the death rates from these diseases are still higher in poor developing countries than they are in rich countries and you know will remain higher until we also have the sanitary responses alongside so it can't be a story of a uh, story of either or it has to be a story of both having having the medical responses is is great um but you know it would be even better, much better to have the sanitary responses as well. But they're expensive. It is expensive to dig hole, you know, big holes in streets and lay down piping and, you know, and 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 have all of the the back end system of, of 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 sewage treatment and of you know water filtration and so on. It's a really complicated engineering challenge, an expensive one made more complicated by you know who owns the land and so on and so forth. So it's a it's a really expensive endeavor, but it's one that has big benefits to people in developing countries. Obviously, it's you know, a quality of life issue, amongst other things. Um, but it also has big global benefits. We, we reduce the chance that a new infection will spread worldwide if we improve global sanitation. Um, and so you know, it's another place where it really makes sense to have a global response to this problem.
I think we should move over to some Q&A from the mm -hmm. audience. Uh, we've got, a, I think, a really interesting question. Uh, how is disinformation around public health in this pandemic compared to past contagions? Social media is a newer aspect, but it certainly isn't the only iteration of word of mouth that is always present. Uh, misinformation has been a common thread through pandemics. Uh, uh, if you go back to the, you know, the Black Death, the um, you know, ask 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 your 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 uh, medical expert of choice, and they might say that it was to do with you know Saturn and Mercury being in alignment. Uh, a lot of them would talk about uh, miasma, the the fact that it was dirty air, unclean air that was was causing the plague. Um, you know, wiser people would point out that those who ran away seem to the countryside seem to survive better. Uh, you know, there were empiricists out there who were um, um, following the evidence a bit, but you know, most of history has involved um, the wrong call on on what caused infectious disease, and so we actually don't have too much evidence on 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 how much more widespread misinformation is now than. Uh, it was in the past where we knew what we were talking about because we've only really had sort of a 120, 150-ish years of, of 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 that time, and I don't, I, I I would struggle to find a case I think where there wasn't at least some inf misinformation around, and and again that's partially for good reasons. So take the COVID nineteen outbreak there's still a lot we don't fully understand about transmission and 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 certainly about treatment um and there was a lot more that we didn't understand back at the start the the whole argument over wearing masks um there were some people from the beginning saying everybody should wear masks uh there were people of goodwill pointing out that there wasn't any evidence that masks worked um there is some suspicion that there were people of goodwill saying there's no evidence that masks work and you shouldn't wear them. And but the real reason they were saying that was because they wanted to keep the masks for the health workers, the noble lie, if you will. Um, and I, you know, if if there were people doing that, I, I I think that's unfortunate. But but it is true we just didn't know in this case whether masks work. I, Looking back, and I wasn't saying this nearly as strongly as the time as I, I'm about to say it, looking back, really what we should have said was there's no strong evidence that masks will work. On the other hand, the downside of wearing a mask is fairly small. And if they do work, the upside's pretty big. Um, and we probably should have been, you know, more in that space than at least I was. I mean, I, uh, I, I was a somewhat early mask proponent, but certainly, you know, not shouting from the rooftops. Um, so, you know, there really is just a lot we don't know. And in any space where there's a lot we don't know, but we're really desperate for answers, we're gonna get misinformation. So it's not new. Um, it is. It has been a constant. If I was to say something positive about COVID-19, I think the amount of harm done by really damaging and really horrible explanations has been less this time than in the past. Uh, if you take the plague outbreak in the late 19th century in San Francisco, where it was you know, the Asian, it was you know, blamed on the Chinese and, 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 and the Chinese American community in San Francisco was treated abominably, um, including uh, having a, a an unreliable plague vaccine stuck in their arms whether they liked it or not um you know there's been less of that this time um than, than in the past so in, in that way we're doing better maybe there has been a bit more of the anti-vax because it's in the air um but it, you know it would be hard to say that it's a lot worse this time than any ever before it's bad this time and it's cost lives and it's terrible but it seems I'm, a, I'm afraid to say it seems to be just a feature of of pandemics you've written a lot about uh decline of american power and uh and i think this next question it relates to china so i, I think you're well suited to answer this one as well is what is your biggest concern with respect to infectious diseases in the coming age of international power balancing between the u.s and china lack of coordination i think is probably the, sh the short answer to that 
what gives me hope is that the eradication of smallpox involved the US and the USSR, as it then was, um, working together uh, with the WHO. Uh, USSR provided a whole load of vaccines, the US did too, along with um, a lot of coordination and, and, and the CDC. And so it was kind of a, a joint global effort, even at the height of the Cold War. So we, we have historical example of uh, a sort of great power rivalry not getting in the way of effective response to infection. And, and I, I, I hope we live up to that. Um, I wish China had been more open at the start. And um, I haven't looked at in detail at the latest WHO report out of China, but you know, I, I, I hope it is um, uh, uh, honest and um, you know re reflects open access. Uh, I don't think that was the big reason for the global spread. I think that you know maybe added a week to 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 our reaction time compared to the six weeks where basically the US and Europe and the Americas just sat around and did nothing. Um, so I don't think it was a big part of the the reason for our slow response, but it it was a factor. And I don't think the US or well, the US or China has done particularly well at thinking globally about vaccines. It's been very much about in the US, it's been very much about um, vaccines for us and, and, and we'll worry about the rest of the world later. China is actually giving out vaccines to the rest of the world, but there are worries about its efficacy, partially because the, the medical trial results have not been properly published. Um, and so, you know, both sides are, are, are not doing as well as they could in this. And, you know, I hope it all of this doesn't become a, I hope that the global in, in, international coordination, the WHO uh, and so on, doesn't get caught up uh, in these increased tensions. As I say, there's, there's historical precedent for it, not so much. Uh, and, and I hope this is, this is another case. If you listen to the Biden administration more generally and the way it talks about relations with China, there does seem to be some understanding of that kind of concept. For example, when they talk about climate change, um, uh, you know, of course, there has to be international cooperation involving China with climate change because now China, and it's even more than the United States does, you know, we're not going to solve a climate problem without China. So, you know, on this, we will work together. And, and so I hope and I believe that the same kind of language will be applied to pandemic preparedness. I hope. This is a question from one of our students, Lizzie. I think it's a, a really interesting one, more about the public policy response uh, with, within the US and probably for other countries. What can be done to stop the poor from falling behind while still doing what's necessary to stop the spread of disease? I think you'd help the poor get ahead if you stop the spread of disease, if, if, if you will. So. Um, I, I, I think this is an area where it, it is just so blatantly, obviously clear that we live on a you know connected planet, and the problems of one of us is the problems of all of us. And the way you reduce the risk of pandemics emerging or spreading um, is in part. Uh, making sure that every country has the surveillance capacity, the ability to isolate patients, um, you know, basic uh, medical care, um, proper respect for antibiotics, improved sanitation, you know, the list goes on. And so I, I think, and if you got the world, all of that, uh, you would make uh, the very poorest on the world much better off than they are right now. Um, and so, uh, I think part of the, the the solution here is 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 greater support for the, the you know for low income communities. Um, I I hope we see that. There's not much sign yet. We're going to uh, if you look at global um, aid flows, they're going down, not up. For example, so I, I worry our response will be sort of too narrowly targeted that there'll be lots of support for pandemic surveillance and none for sanitation. I guess that's better than no support for either, but it's a, it's a very partial view of the problem. This is another interesting question I like a lot. Infectious disease has been around as long as trade and travel. So why do you think we find pandemics so much more forgettable than other disasters? As you mentioned, mask wearing and social distancing aren't new, but 
we did forget about them a little bit. Hmm. That that is a great question. I, I, it's partially that there haven't actually been all that many, all that terrible pandemics uh, in 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 recent decades. I mean, you know, COVID nineteen is um has killed way more people than it should, and has killed a lot of people. You'd only have to go back to the 1920s or 1930s in the United States for two million Americans dying, which was, you know, at the start of the COVID-19 epidemic, there was there was some fear that the pandemic, there was estimates that, you know, if the United States did nothing, two million would die. Far too many are going to die, but, you know, we hope not two million. That would have brought the US death rate from uh, uh, COVID-19 back to the sort of an average infectious death rate for the 1920s, 1930s in the United States. You know, that's how much progress we've made. Um, and so, you know, it's just, a, it's, it's, a, it's a sign of, of how much less frequent pandemics have got. And we had the experience of Ebola reasonably recently where everybody in the United States got incredibly scared about Ebola with really not much in the way of good reason um i mean a horrible disease and 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 had terrible effects in west africa was never going to be a big threat in the united states but you know at one point i i think it was the, the in the list of sort of health concerns of the united states it went um uh heart disease strokes ebola it's like, that's crazy um uh, uh and because it turned out that we massively overreacted to the threat of a brother in the United States. I wonder if I didn't, you know, make the problem even worse. It's like, oh well, no, we know pandemics aren't an issue for us. Look at Ebola, um, and so we got even more relaxed than we might have been. Um, so, you know, if you sort of add together the distance since the last time there was a really bad pandemic in the United States, which you know is sort of 100 years ish. Um, to the fact that the last time we were really worried about a pandemic, nothing happened. Um, you know, maybe that lulled us into a particularly false, false sense of security. And uh, I, guess, I mean, I guess the one more thing I'd add is um, there is actually a reasonably strong. Um, I mean, I bet everybody on this Zoom has you know heard of the Black Death, for example. Um, uh, we, you know, th there is sort of some shared sense of of oh terrible in, in infection but I, I i think it it is very much a historical sense um as you know that happened in the bad old days and maybe again the silver lining of COVID 19 uh, we won't be thinking that anymore we're down to just the last few minutes so i, I sorry i'm i'm really excited thank you again so much i I think a really great way to end would be what signs do you see for optimism and what signs do you see for concerns that we that we should be spreading the optimism as a way to make sure that we also start tackling those areas of concern. Thank you. So and, and thank you and sorry if I by blathering on too long, uh, um, uh, there, there, there are questions unanswered. Um, I am broadly an optimistic person, so let me start off with the, the, the pessimism. Uh, Back 10 years ago, I used to pretty much year on year write uh, a piece for The Atlantic or The Washington Post or somewhere uh, titled, uh, uh, this is the best year in human history. Um, and it used to be, you know, the gift that kept on giving um, because every year poverty would go down, uh, uh, premature mortality would go down, the trends on democracy were positive, literacy rates were improving, you know, you name it, um, think, 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 things were looking up. You couldn't write that, that column about this last year, however you tried to massage the data. Um, it was a, a, a grim and horrible year, but not just a grim and horrible year. It had come after about a five to 10 year span of basically backsliding in global democracy. Um, the most sort of optimistic taste to take is we plateaued on 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 level of global democracy. I, I think you can definitely make the case for worse than that. Um, uh, if you look at, at at climate and our response to it, it's been fairly grim. And then you know when you add on uh, COVID nineteen and and its terrible impacts, not just in health but on on the global economy, um, you know it's been it's been a grim period. And I don't think we're going to bounce back. I hope we bounce back from the health effects fairly quickly. I don't think we're going to bounce back from the economic effects 
for longer. And that's in part because a lot of businesses have gone away forever and it takes time to start new businesses. But it's also because a lot of connections that would have happened just aren't going to happen. Um, you know, if you just think about how much global trade and, 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 and um, innovation is based on sort of serendipitous meeting of people, all of which pretty much stopped last year. It's going to, you know, that's going to be connections lost forever. And, and so I, I worry that it's going to be a drag on the global economy for, you know, a decade or more. There's, there's, there's the misery. <laughs> now the positivity. <laughs> we, COVID-19 shifted our progress on extreme poverty, dollar ninety a day poverty, back five or six years on global health, six or seven years. This massive, terrible global pandemic was only equal to sort of six or seven years worth of the progress we've been making. We have been on a pretty good run and I don't think there's a reason to think it will stop. I've just given you reasons to say it might slow down, it may take a bit of time to get back, but I don't think there's any reason to think it's gonna stop. 2019 may also be the year where we max out global carbon dioxide emissions. We need to do a lot better than just plateauing. Obviously, we need to drop them very rapidly to avoid climate change. But you know, we are making progress on that. I don't think there is a sort of COVID-19 also is going, I hope, to lead to you know, much better preparedness against the risk of pandemics. Um, I don't think there's a reason to think that we won't continue seeing the sort of global progress we've seen for the last few decades forward into the future. And if so, the world is going to be a better and better place. Thanks again. Let me share really quickly the a manifesto for globalization in the general chat because it's it's a great essay. I think everyone ought to read it. Uh, and as well, the book is another great uh, read that everyone should should take some time to delve into. Like I said, I learned a lot, and I I think you're right. There's this great optimistic story we can tell out of the story of of COVID nineteen for the long run, even as much of a dumpster fire of a year as 2020 was for everyone. Uh, but thank you again, Charles. I I don't know if you have any last thoughts you want to share with everyone, uh, but I, I really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much for having me. I, I hope it was in, of interest uh, and, and good luck all to getting somewhat closer back to normal soon. <laughs> thank you again. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us.